On today's episode, Kyle Larson gets a sword, Dale Jr. says the F word, is Lando Norris the best driver in the world now? Plus, we have some voicemail. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. I'm Matt. What a weekend at Bristol, one that was probably pretty forgettable at this point. It wasn't the best weekend we've seen at Bristol Motor Speedway, which is fine, right? Not every race can be an absolute banger. Springtime at Bristol, banger. Night race at Bristol, bit of a snoozer. It's a lot like watching a no-hitter happen when Kyle Larson's out there leading 462 of the 500 laps. 496, if you count the laps that he led with his teammate Alex Bowman, Hendrick Motorsports dominated the night. It's, like I said, a lot like watching a no-hitter. It's cool. It's cool to see. You can appreciate it. At the same time, though, you're like, I would like to see a little bit of action happen here. And there just wasn't a lot to be had on Saturday night at Bristol on the famed High Banks. But it goes, you know, hand in hand. Not every race can be very good. It's like when Martin Truex Jr. went out and led like, what was it, 392 of 400 laps at the Coke 600. Yeah, that was a bit of a snoozer. And that was a different circumstances. We know that the Gen 7 car isn't the best on short tracks. We understand that. NASCAR understands that. Everybody understands that. I say we as if I'm NASCAR, and that will certainly fire up the people that are like, he's getting paid by NASCAR. Listen, they didn't pay me this past week, all right? So I'm going to say what I want. I might even leak the script. You guys want to know what happens in the second round of the playoffs? I bet you do. I bet you do. Some of you aren't going to be happy about it either. So you have to wait and find out. But if you make me mad enough, maybe I'll go ahead and share it. What happens? Regardless, what happened on Saturday night wasn't ideal. Goodyear needs to bring a better tire to the racetrack. Goodyear needs to understand why the tire, if it is in fact the same tire from the spring that they ran here in the fall, why doesn't it react the same way? Now, this is also supposedly the same tire that we used at the last year Bristol night race. Last year Bristol night race. Last year's Bristol night race. What a weird way for me to say that. So we've had a tire that acts three different ways now, including a tire that the same tire that they took to a summer tire test at Bristol when it was 90 degrees out and recreated the same problem from the spring. So something's going on here and Goodyear needs to really figure it out. The big cat gift, figure it out. Yeah, that's what we're having to deal with right now because this is just kind of unacceptable. The product is not very good and 120,000 people paid to be there on Saturday night. A great, great crowd. No complaints about uh, attendance, even though I still maintain that a half full Bristol is better than most of the racetracks around the country, even though visually it doesn't look good. 70,000 people is still 30,000 more than what will be at the championship race in Phoenix um, come what a month now, basically a little bit over a month from now. So, yeah, it's. Uh, you got a lot of people showing up to watch these races, and if they're not seeing a good product, it's going to be hard to convince them to come back. It wasn't the best race that we've ever seen. And like I said, not every race is going to be. At the same time, NASCAR needs to work with Goodyear. Goodyear needs to be better. NASCAR needs Goodyear to be better because we're not getting a thousand horsepower. We just know we're not getting that. And tires are probably the easiest fix out there for this car on short tracks. This car race is great on intermediates. Car race is pretty good on road courses. It's okay on super speedways, probably could definitely be better on super speedways, but short tracks is really what? That's NASCAR's wheelhouse. That's what NASCAR was built on, the beating and banging of short tracks. Now we get to a short track and it's like, oh, the guy that got a speeding penalty, 0 0.09 mile per hour is essentially what Dune, Martin Trex Jr.'s chances at a championship this year, other than the fact that like they've just been running like dog food at times. Um, they get mired back in traffic and they can't pass people. Now, I hear from a ton of people saying that there was no passing on Saturday night. Now, that's just vehemently not true because Kyle Larson passed damn near everybody. He lapped all the way up to 10th place. You could pass people. You just had to have a really good car to do it. But I mean, even at times, he struggled to put Daniel Suarez his third lap down for probably a dozen laps. He was battling it out with him. Ty Gibbs got a speeding penalty early on in the race, and he was only able to drive back up to 15th. You could pass people. It was very difficult. And I know there's a lot of people that don't like multi-lane Bristol, the people that want single-lane Bristol to come back. Listen, multi-lane Bristol is the far superior version of Bristol. The conveyor belt Bristol, where you're just riding around and then trying to move one person out of the way every now and then, that's fine. But when you can see what the short track could be here in Bristol... With the multi-lanes, that's a better product. And I know it's not a popular opinion amongst a lot of the fan base, but the last, you know, 10 years of the Gen 6 car at Bristol, specifically the night race, were absolutely phenomenal races, regardless of what people think about it. Not every pass should be super easy. Sometimes you have to work for it. And Bristol, right now, as a multi-lane racetrack, races a lot like a dirt track. You can dive in on the bottom, somebody's going to roll the top, get a run off, and then you just kind of do this teeter-totter back and forth until one of you clears the other. That's good racing. That's racing. The bump and run is fine, but if you really want to watch that every single night, uh, you can go up to Bowman Gray or go up to Riverhead in uh, New York. Go somewhere on a short track where they're going to run single file, file conveyor belt 
and you can watch it there, which is totally fine. That's an acceptable form of racing. I'm not saying that it's bad. We're going to get it in Martinsville in a couple weeks from now, a few weeks from now at this point. So regardless, just not everything can be, you know, the best race we've ever seen at all times. Somebody, sometimes people hit it uh, and hit the setup perfectly right. And man, did Cliff Daniels and Kyle Larson do just that on Saturday night at Bristol. After the race, so Kyle Larson pulls up into victory lane, had a really nice moment with his son as well on the front stretch. After he talked to, um, talked to TV, he turns around and just gives his son like the most genuine, like affectionate dad hug that you've seen. And like, it was just a nice moment in all honesty. And then the kid gets in the car, rides up, to uh, victory lane with him. And then, of course, at Bristol, you get that gigantic gladiator sword because it's the last great Coliseum. And Larson is standing up there biting it. Thankfully, it's not sharp, I guess. Uh, hopefully not. Um, but either way, it's a very cool trophy to get. I also get a gigantic trophy that comes along with that. So hats off to Kyle Larson and that five team. Pick up their fifth win of the season, have once again, you know, reasserted themselves as probably the best team in the playoffs at the moment. Now they're heading to a track at Kansas that they won at back in the spring, have run really well at then they're off to Talladega and the Roval if you're Kyle Larson and Cliff Daniels you want to win next weekend in Kansas because you head to Talladega and you can probably go ahead and chalk that up as a DNF knowing what Kyle Larson's track record is on super speedways and then you don't want to go into the Roval and have to um try to squeak that one out especially with that new hairpin turn going back out onto the banking and what oval turn one and two and then with the new chicane um the final chicane on the front stretch could be in for a wild race at the roval dale jr made his triumphant return to the nascar xfinity series for his lone start of the year uh he's been doing this what ever since he retired um from full-time nascar cup series competition and got the people out the bristol uh Friday night race had more people in attendance than it typically does. Why? Because, well, Dale Jr. is there, and this could be his last ever start, except on the radio, he was like, man, I'm thinking about doing this again in a couple years, so maybe we'll see him back in 2026 and get him back out at Bristol or whatever track he wants to run at. But for Dale to be almost 50 years old, for him to get a P7 finish after the night he had was pretty remarkable. And then to sit around and drink beer until basically 2 a.m. on the front stretch, that's also pretty impressive for a guy that's about to turn 50 in a couple of weeks. So hats off to him. His night, though, uh, was eventful, right? He rolls off pit road. Uh, they can't hear him or he can't hear the team. So he and TJ and uh, their crew chief, Andrew Overstreet, are talking to each other. Nobody can hear anybody. Dale then is, you know, just saying the F word on the radio, which was very funny because frustrated Dale is always probably pretty funny he then has to take his helmet off he tries to get you know he swaps helmet out swaps earbuds that doesn't fix the issue they put him a radio in hook that to his chest give him a push to pass or push to pass uh push to talk button that they clip to his uh, chest he then drops the radio down on the floorboards which then that jacks the volume up so now he's asking tj to speak quiet and tj's like yeah i'll go ahead and try to do that for you so he's not screaming into his his ears there uh, got a, into a battle with Riley Herbst, gave Riley Herbst the bird and, and flipped him off. Lost his glasses at one point, thought they were, you know, on the floorboards of the car. Nope, they were in his old helmet. So they handed those back through so he could see out on the racetrack. And overall, just an eventful night for him. Had a great battle with Ryan Newman Truex there at the end as well, as Truex became impossible to pass uh, at times. But Overall, a great night for Dale Jr. and that entire number 88 team. It's cool to see the young guys, too, in the Xfinity Series want to go out and have a drink with Dale afterwards on pit road. Very funny moment when Dale was like, tell Riley to come down and get a beer. And then he's like, is he over 21? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he, he is. But that's just what you have to ask in the Xfinity Series because he couldn't have Connor Zilich come down and have a beer. Although... I do believe Connor Zilich did get the actual champagne on the podium on Sunday at the um, IMSA six hour uh, in Indianapolis for the LMP2 category, which is pretty interesting there. I think somebody maybe mixed that up and probably forgot to give him the uh, sparkling water or sparkling grape juice or whatever they were supposed to have uh, there for him. All right, time to move into the voicemail power hour. Should I call it power block like they have on Mav TV? I don't know. David Stacy might come after me or Stacy David. Stacy David <laughs> might come after me. Regardless, it's time for the voicemails. Let's get into it. Hello, Matt. This is Josh calling from West Nebraska. I hope that you and your listeners are having an excellent day today. So I have a couple of uh, questions to ask with you. Um, I heard on Eric Estep's channel that Corey LaJoy is not committed to being at Rick Ware Racing, or was it vice versa? I, I think it was the vice versa. So Rick Ware is not committed to LaJoy after the end of the 2024 season. So the question I have is, where do you think he ends up next? 
does he find another team or is there somewhere in Xfinity or trucks where he can go down to? Does somebody replace him in the 51 after this year? I'm not sure. That's why I'm asking you. But I also wanted to ask about Geico. Now that Geico is ending their partnership with NASCAR after 2024, what takes its place as a premier partner of NASCAR? Which sponsor will take the restart zone? So just asking for your thoughts, and I hope you all have a great and fantastic rest of your day. Goodbye. Awesome. Thanks, Josh from West Nebraska. I've actually been to West Nebraska, driven across I-80, across that entire state. Made a drive back from San Francisco to Cincinnati one time in 36 hours, probably a little bit under that. Very stupid. I highly don't recommend. But North Platte, Nebraska, lovely place. Um, Ended up stopping there to look at, I believe there's a Challenger train there. My brother wanted to stop. Either way, enough about Nebraska real quick. Thanks for calling in, Josh. Yeah, Eric Eastep, phenomenal job over on his channel as well. In terms of Corey LaJoy and Rick Ware Racing, yes, neither are committed to each other past 2025 at the moment. Corey LaJoy's name has come up in discussions about possibly going over to Rick Ware Racing now that Justin Haley is gone. Those rumors have been going around for a little bit, basically as long as Justin Haley's you know rumors to Spire have been going around, so essentially since the summer break. Where does Corey LaJoy end up at? I, he does have a bit of budget with him. I've heard his name mentioned in the Rick Ware racing spot. Whoever takes that 51 car is going to have to bring some funding. Corey does bring a bit of funding with him. It would make sense for him to land over there. I do know that he was offered a very competitive truck ride as well. Maybe he doesn't want to take that step down from racing on Sundays to racing on Fridays, Thursdays, sometimes Saturdays, maybe even a random Sunday here and there. Uh, maybe he doesn't want to do that quite yet. And I would argue that he should. I think taking a step down, winning races, contending for a championship will do more for his will do more for his stock in the sport. But hey, racing on Sunday keeps you in front of a bunch of NASCAR Cup Series team owners and maybe going out there grinding and proving yourself is the way to go. Right now, he's obviously been in the center of a few different controversies. But yeah, I would expect him to potentially carry on his relationship over at Rick Ware Racing. Um, is it going to be full-time, part-time? That remains up in the air. Um, but yeah, I do think that he would like to stay in the Cup Series. Man, Corey LaJoy must be hung like a motherfucker right now because he sure likes to crash his damn car a lot. Hell, he went for a crash for one last time with Spire last week at Bristol. And I wouldn't be surprised if he crashes the next six weeks with Rick Ware. Come on, Corey LaJoy. Or maybe he's Corey LaJoke, because that's all he does every week. So yeah, I don't know who that guy was. Clearly not a Corey LaJoy uh, fan there. Listen, Corey LaJoy has been certainly catching the brunt end of a lot of jokes, including the Corey LaJoke. I don't know if he's hung like an mf -er, though that would be a bit questionable, considering I thought that was Kyle Larson at this point. But Corey LaJoy, is he going to wreck in the next six weeks with Rick Ware Racing? The non-Corey LaJoy fan there. Uh, there are seven races left, so I don't know what's happening. Maybe he knows something we don't, that Corey LaJoy is getting kicked out of that ride a week uh, early, but I don't expect him to wreck as much. I felt I feel like he was trying to prove himself so much aspire to be like, oh man, one, I deserve this ride. Once he found out he's getting fired, and then it would turned into, you know, I'm going to show you guys what you could possibly be missing here. And it just hasn't worked out for him. Ends up on his lid at Michigan, gets caught up in the first lap incident at Watkins Glen, two incidents on Sun or Saturday night at Bristol. Just not a good time for Corey LaJoy. Thanks for calling in, though. Hey, Matt, it's John from Florida. I'm not really understanding why people hate Alex Bowman so much or want to see him out of the 48 or out of Hendrick Motorsports. It seems like he's good when he's not hurt or uh breaking his leg or getting a concussion that he's usually good for about one win and a playoff appearance per year. Uh, otherwise, it's just kind of vanilla, I guess, but still decent enough. I guess like a, a version of Paul Menor that actually wins races more often. So I don't think Justin Haley's going to be that much better or kind of a downgrade, I guess, if he does get the the 48 car in 2026 so we'll see how that goes but yeah not really seeing why bowman is so hateable but i guess that's kind of the reddit crowd and how they behave and reddit's just going to be reddit anyway 
Thanks, Mike. Awesome. Thanks for calling in John from Florida. I believe that he was on last week's episode as well. Yeah, I honestly don't get the Alex Bowman hate either. Alex Bowman is a very formidable race car driver. He's an eight time NASCAR Cup Series winner. I think he gets a lot of hate because people think he continually backs into his wins. But when you think about it, Jimmy Johnson backed into a lot of wins as well. Putting yourself in position to capitalize is the name of the game. Like that's a great way to win races. You don't have to go out there and lead every single lap and win the race. They hand out the trophy to the person that crosses the finish line first. However you get there is up to you. I'm never going to fault somebody for winning a race. I mean, Austin Dillon's a five-time race winner. I don't agree with the way he did it at Richmond, but his previous four wins, as much as people want to discount them, he still was the first guy to reach the start finish line. Same with Alex Bowman. You don't become an eight-time NASCAR Cup Series winner because you're bad. No, Alex Bowman is a really good race car driver, and he's a great personality, too. I think people just don't understand his sense of humor, which is unfortunate because he has a very good dry sense of humor and it certainly makes me laugh more often than not uh i think what people get upset about is the fact that he's not performing at like a kyle larson or even a chase elliott level william byron you can toss him in there too but when you think about it the fourth car at hendrick motorsports has never performed as well as the top two cars and Honestly, having three cars that perform as well as Hendrick Motorsports has had over the last few years is a bit of a rarity. It's typically two cars that perform well. You have one car that performs really well, another car that's a step below it, another car that's probably two steps below that, and then a car that's a step below there. So it's not out of the ordinary to see one of their cars struggle. But at the same time, they do have all four cars into victory lane at one point this year or another. He has the same amount of wins as Chase Elliott has in the last two seasons. So... Yeah, I don't understand the hate. I don't think Justin Haley is an upgrade over Alex Bowman if that's what ends up happening in 2026. Uh, I think Alex Bowman should be in that car, and I think that he's good enough to be there regardless of what the people say. Hey, this is Ray from London, Ohio. Yeah, I want your opinion. I know with this whole new charter deal, they said you can have a three-car team. And I understand that Gibbs and Hendrick, they said it's fathered in, but I, in my opinion, I don't think it's fair because Roush had to get rid of one of their teams when they had to go from five to four. So I was just want to know if that was fair or not. And by the way, I love your show. Awesome. I appreciate that so much, Ray from Ohio. So yeah, what Ray is alluding to here is Roush used to run five full-time NASCAR Cup Series teams, and then NASCAR put a cap on how many teams a Cup Series uh, owner could field on a full-time basis. They would allow you to make select starts for a rookie driver. They ended up axing that as well. That's how uh, Chase Elliott actually made his first starts in the NASCAR Cup Series, the 25 car, Napa car. But yeah, I think prob people probably forget that happened in 2015. But what Ray is talking about here is with the new charter agreement, one of the proposals, you know, one of the line items that was in the proposal was that teams would only only be allowed to own three NASCAR Cup Series charters. So you would only have three guaranteed starting spots in the field for your teams. You can still field a fourth open car if you want to, but in terms of, you know, guaranteed starting spots, you could only have three charters. However, they were going to grandfather in Hendrick Motorsports as well as Joe Gibbs Racing and allow them to keep their four charters. So what Ray's saying here is he thinks that they should have to sell off one of their charter. Um, I don't entirely disagree with that, Ray. I think it's... a I don't have as big of a problem with it as I think probably some people do just because even if they did sell off that charter, guess what? Hendrick Motorsports is then going to put all the resources from that fourth car into a car at like Spire. Think about how right now, essentially Joe Gibbs racing and 2311 racing are a six car team. That's what we would see happen if they had to sell off one of their, you know, charters. They're just going to be instead of one three car team, it's going to be one like six car team with their, you know, other charters and other uh, partners out there. So as much as I'm like, yeah, I want to see it be, you know, straight line across the board. Not much was going to change that all that resources, sponsorship, money, driver, everything like that was probably just going to go to another team. Um and continue on with the relationship with Hendrick Motorsports just under the Spire banner or whoever it was going to be. So I don't have a major issue with it. I understand why people absolutely do. It certainly uh, seems like favoritism to the other ones. If teams were going to get an equity share of NASCAR, as some of them wanted back when this whole charter negotiation thing started two years ago, I would have an issue with that because... Um, that's where things get a little bit more confusing uh, because having four teams is definitely a bigger share than somebody that has three teams and those teams maybe want to have four cars so they have the same share but then they're not allowed to that's where things get a little bit more difficult but as of, for right now not that upset about it barring some things possibly changing 
Hey, it's Jordan from South Dakota. I'm just curious, as a guy in the Midwest, do you figure that NASCAR is getting a little bit more uh, southeast focused with their 2025 schedule? I just, I worry a little bit. We only lost one race at Kansas. I'm a Kansas season ticket holder, but we lost one truck race, and I just feel like maybe they're trying to move more east. Um, I appreciate what you have to say about that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for calling in, Jordan, from South Dakota. Never been to South Dakota, but it's cool that you're a Kansas season ticket holder. That's obviously, yeah, definitely the closest track uh, to you. Just a nice drive across Nebraska, like we were talking about the uh, other guy from uh, the Plains area as well, a few calls back. So, yeah, is NASCAR getting a little bit more East Coast-centric for their schedule? Um, a little bit, right? It certainly feels that way. Obviously, we would like to see more races in the Midwest. The problem is there's not a ton of big markets. Obviously, they added Iowa in for 2024. So that kind of fills in, you know, another race there. Yeah, you lost a truck race there. That sucks. I get it, especially if you're a season ticket holder. Um, but like, yeah, the trucks are going to Lime Rock, which is East Coast. But that's a market that they haven't been in uh, before up there. Uh, Lime Rock specifically. Then you have them going down to Rockingham as well. And yeah, I think there's a big sect of the NASCAR fan base. I would like to see them race more in the Southeast, except like over half the schedule right now is what I would consider to be in that Southeastern United States region. And that's enough, right? I would like to see the NASCAR Cup Series expand to a few more different cities out West and hit some different markets at that. Even going into some, you know, maybe smaller markets in the Plains is still going to attract a big crowd. I mean, look at Iowa, what they put about 30 to 40 ish thousand fans in there uh, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, if you had another race like that, whether that be in western Nebraska or like Cheyenne, Wyoming or something like that, another market that, you know, is a decent population populated area. You bring a big time event to that area, people are going to come out for it. The problem is the infrastructure and the lack of racetracks and everything that goes along with that. But yeah, it does feel like they maybe are moving a little bit back to the East Coast. But at the same time, I think Ben Kennedy has some bigger visions for the schedule. And I'm interested to see what they are because I don't think they're always going to be focused on the Southeast. Hey Matt, it's Nathan from Indiana. Uh, I was wondering, like, do you honestly see Corey LaJoy with, like, a future? Like, do you think he gets a ride next year? Or is he, like, going somewhere, like, he's going to go work for Walmart? Because, I mean, it just seems like after Pocono, it's just everybody hates them and just wants them to get out of NASCAR. Like, I mean, I honestly think he should just be banned from Cup. I mean, he's caused so many incidents. So, like, I mean, do you think he gets a ride next year? Or do you think he's just out there working at McDonald's somewhere. Thanks for calling in Nathan from Indiana. It probably isn't going to make you feel great, but my dog's name is uh, Nathan as well. Obviously, I call him Nate more often than not, unless he's in trouble. But thanks for calling in. Is Corey LaJoy going to be working at Walmart next year? Is he going to be working at McDonald's? Stacking pennies. Go ahead and retire that name. He's going to be stacking burgers. No, I do think he'll end up in NASCAR, right? He's a legacy name. He brings a bit of funding with him. He's got great ties in NASCAR with NASCAR. So yeah, I would fully expect Corey LaJoy to be on the grid somewhere next season. As we talked about, a few calls ago um his name has been in that rick Ware racing rumor mill as a potential landing spot for him next year i know he's offered a good truck as well and he does have opportunities out there he of course right now is the hot name to hate people are having a fun time dunking on Corey lajoy but at the same time he's a guy i think that just needs to figure out what the heck he's doing right now he's a guy that's been under a lot of pressure he's racing for his job, racing for his livelihood. Uh, so I think that goes a long way. It's like watching a pitcher melt down and you're like, uh, and he knows that he's on that borderline of getting sent down to the minors or not. And you're like, dude, if you could just relax for like just one outing, I think things would get a lot better for you. And Corey just needs one of those races where he flies under the radar, doesn't hit anybody, doesn't end up on his roof, doesn't have anything bad happen and, and it'll be fine. But for now, he is staying on the front of everybody's, everybody's mind. There's a gigantic oak tree outside my office window right here in my house and uh the squirrels just sat up there sit up there and my neighbors have a greenhouse and they sit there and they drop them also the awning off the first floor of my house over the back patio area is um steel roof it's a very old house uh and they drop these acorns like chinese water torture and just bang bang drives me crazy 
Hate the squirrels. Hate them. All right, now that my squirrel tirade is done, thanks for everybody for calling in for the voicemail power hour, which is usually like 10 minutes. Uh, appreciate that. If you want to call in and leave a voicemail, 513-445-9809. Give me a call. I'll include it in next week's episode as well, barring like a ton of ones coming in. If we get multiple, I try to combine them and usually just use uh, probably the first one that I hear. Uh, so if you didn't hear your call, it's probably because of that. If I missed it, let me know in the comments and I'll figure all that out. Today's video is sponsored by Lock. Lockdown brand. Head over to lockdownbrand.com today for your motorsports inspired apparel. Their shirts are absolutely phenomenal. Their hats equally as great. Use code BREAKHARD10 at checkout to save 10%. Also, do not forget that there is now a BREAKHARD blog as well. I'm posting about two to three times a week. I will have my Monday morning cooldown lap out on Monday morning. So go ahead and sign up. You have it delivered to your inbox by clicking the link that is down in the description below. Moving on to the Formula One race real quick. Uh, Lando Norris, is he now the best race car driver in the world? Uh, because it seems like Formula One fans want to argue that Max is the greatest race car driver in the world. Uh, but Max has always just been in the best car, and that now makes him the best driver in the world. You mentioned that Kyle Larson is a better all-around driver, and they're like, well, he couldn't win a Formula One race. Okay, Max Verstappen couldn't win in any of the cars that uh, Kyle Larson has either. But now that he doesn't have the fastest car, is he still the greatest driver in the world? And now that Lando has the fastest car, does that make him the greatest driver in the world? Because that seems to be like the prereq for being classified as that. Regardless, Lando Norris went out there and absolutely dominated the Singapore Grand Prix on Sunday. It wasn't even close. Like Red Bull, he Red Bull got done to them what Max was doing to people last year. It was an absolute evisceration of sorts as Lando Norris just drove away from the field on Sunday on the streets of uh, around Marina Bay. Now, you know, Red Bull's got to sit back and wonder, you know, we can't afford to have another bad race uh, because right now, as it stands, Lando Norris can win every race. He can win every sprint. And as long as Max finishes second to him and all of those, Max still wins the championship. Thanks to Daniel Ricciardo going out and stealing the fastest lap of the race on the last lap, which brings up another point. Uh, you shouldn't be allowed to own two teams because at the conflict of interest, you manipulated the championship at this point by taking that point away because you knew that you could sacrifice one of your other cars on the junior team to do that. And I don't like that at all. Zach Brown doesn't like that. A lot of people in Formula One don't like that. We'll keep Andretti out and Cadillac out because uh, we don't want them in, but we'll continue to allow another team own a smaller team and use that to manipulate races. Makes total sense in the world. Just dummies over there. Um, not often my own Max Verstappen side, though, but this whole swearing situation that he has going on with Mohammed bin Salman and the FIA, 100% on Max's side. I love the fact that he's not answering questions in the FIA press room and instead inviting everybody back to the Red Bull hospitality area, and he'll answer all the questions there. That way he won't get fined for saying something. Appreciated uh, Lewis standing up for him as well and being like, I wouldn't do the community service. I hope Max doesn't do the you know community service. This is ridiculous, like that type of sentiment. So yeah, it wasn't a great race. It was very much like uh, the Bristol night race on Saturday night. One guy going out and leading and then everybody else kind of sitting in the back. Franco uh, Colapinto, though, had one heck of a start at the beginning. And this is how you know, like the some guys are getting old. They're like, oh, my God, he almost wrecked all of us. He didn't wreck anybody. They actually didn't even make contact. And you guys all got out of his way. So he's going to continue to do that as long as you uh, do that. But heck of a start from him. Certainly didn't see Logan Sargent do anything uh, like that. However, Alex Albon did get, you know, make some contact with him, said some things on the radio that were complaining about him. And if IndyCar's experience with the Argentinian fans has taught me anything, Alex, you got to shut the hell up can't be saying something or the people are going to come after you from Argentina. They are crazy down there. So yeah, that's what happened in Formula One this weekend. Obviously, IndyCar's off. They got charters, though. They all got a piece of paper. Zach Brown's now sitting around like, what do now? Like he's Charlie Day and always sunny. And it doesn't really fix anything right now. It gives them potential equity. Some people seem to think that they're worth high 600,000, maybe low seven figures, low million, uh, somewhere in that range. So we'll wait and see when the first one goes up for sale. Prem is looking to buy one. If you have one, maybe get in contact uh, with them. The charter, though, does not guarantee a starting spot in the Indianapolis 500, which is exactly how it should be. Go fast or go home. Fast with 33 deserve to start that race. I don't care what your name is. I don't care what team you race for. I don't care how many times you've won this race. If you're not fast enough to qualify in the top 33, go ahead and pack it up, head back to the shop. So happy that they went ahead and did that. Looking ahead to what's on TV this week, uh, no Formula One in action. They are basically off until, well, a month from now, almost three week break until the uh, United States Grand Prix in Austin, probably without Daniel Ricciardo, uh, honorary Texan down there, which is a bummer. But this week 
On television, we have Friday night at 5.30, the ARCA series from Kansas. Hopefully it's better than the ARCA series at Bristol because that was a bit of a um, uh, shoe show, as DBC likes to say. At 8.30 on Friday night is the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series race from Kansas. It is the elimination of the first round. Uh, Friend of the program, Daniel Dye, currently sits seven points below the cutoff line, so we'll wait and see how he... um, Climbs back above it. I think that he's going to advance on on Friday night. On Saturday, you have uh, NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series practice and qualifying at 11 for Xfinity, uh, 1 p.m. for the Cup Series. And then at 4 p.m. on the CW, you have the NASCAR Xfinity Series, the first race of their first round of the playoffs. And then on Sunday, you have the NASCAR Cup Series at 3 o'clock on USA. Um, First race of the second round for the Cup Series there. Maybe somebody will lock themselves into the second round and not have to worry, a third round rather, and not have to worry about Talladega or the Roval. That would be ideal for, well, one of those 12 drivers come Sunday. So let me know in the comments what you think about the show, the voicemails, uh, the tires, Cup Series, Formula One, IndyCar, whatever you want to talk about. Let me know in the comments. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.